Welcome to Free Media Free Minds. Free Media Free Minds is a program that explores media freedom, diversity, and access to information. My name is Pume Zamtegazi. And I'm Haldi Jansen Daubia. In this episode of Free Media Free Minds, we talk the cost of communication. What are the roles of telecommunication companies in encouraging or hampering our right to communicate? There are implications for us as citizens, particularly when our right to communicate is restricted by the high costs to make a cell phone call, for example. Joining us in studio to discuss this further is Mike, Mark, sorry Mark, <laughs> Mark Weinberg from a Right to Know campaign director. Thank you for joining us again, Mark. Good to be here. And next to him is Ahmed Kaji and is the consultant from the DG Marie Trust on Cost of Communication. Welcome. Thank you. And it's Mike Aldrich from Cape Town TV. Thank you, Mark. And Peter Benjamin from Cell Live. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Um, before we discuss, we get into our discussion, let's watch a clip <coughs> featuring citizens protesting against high cell phone rates. Are here to support the right to know in their campaign uh, for free SMSs every day and now and then. Uh, simply because uh, we are coming from the poor communities uh, whereby you find that the majority of the people are, un are unemployed and then they hardly afford to buy a time. So we simply see that it is, it is a good thing to do and then uh, we really support them on that. I think for the the eight time if you buy eight time whether it is Vodacom or anything, then the eight time goes very quick. If you only give your talk to your family or even on the phone, then it goes quick on the phone on the phone times. And about the, the SMSs also to pre of charge SMS is definitely to have that. So that we can have a better communication also with one another also and talk longer with people also. That is important for right now. They're asking us as I am not going to name the our yeah. They ask us to come and support them because why? They are, because most of people are using internet over their phones, cell phones. Now for them it's too difficult because maybe they buy a time of five, five rand. They don't have free SMSs. May, some of them are, are on data bundles. So they are fighting. They, they need discount. SMSs, free SMSs, free discount and everything. I came here to support them much just because like this thing affecting the whole of us. You see, like sometimes you get a chance to buy airtime. When you want to make a phone call, you don't have airtime. Maybe just check your Facebook. You see. If you've just joined us, you're watching Free Media, Free Minds. And that was a clip showcasing the work of the Right to Communicate campaign. Mark, the Right to Communicate campaign comes out of the Right to Know campaign. Um, but tell us and tell our audiences, why are our telecommunication costs so high in this country? Yeah, well, the right to know basically realized that if we can stop secrecy, we still haven't got the right to know because information gets bottled up in our cities, in our elites. So it must flow across society. And in South Africa, we've got a very uneven media, but almost everyone has a cell phone. So if we can make these cell phones the pipes that information flows through, we could have the right to know. Mm. Of course, in South Africa, the biggest barrier is the cost. The fact that people have the phone, can access the network, mm. but can't afford to use them. So, Ahmed, you're from the DG Mari Trust, consultant on working on the cost to communicate. Um, and I think that both you and Mark can bear us out when we say that South Africa has the third highest cost of telecommunications in the world. Why is this? Mm. And who benefits from it? Well, the network operators, the mobile network operators. That Please mention them. Who are they? <laughs> well, we've got MTN, Vodacom, Cell C, and Telcom Mobile. I think uh, the key issue is um, the cost are not um, the prices that they charge are not cost-based prices. The prices that they charge are based on um, the maximum profit um, value that they can derive from it. Um, as a result, uh, they've set uh, prices that are not sustainable so that they can maximize the amount of money they make. What they don't seem to, to note or, or realize is that uh, mobile costs and the high costs serve as a deterrent uh, to use it for socioeconomic development. 
Uh, and that's one of the critical issues that, that I'm working on, in that when a person needs to access a uh, health um, uh, platform, for example, uh, Peter's work on cell life, um, you had an, a USSD platform that assists people with HIV AIDS. Now, it's 20 cents per 20 seconds, and for a person to access that for three or five minutes, uh, whatever that duration is, is a bit too high. So if we purport to use mobile platforms for social development, such as job creation, education, uh, maternal welfare, what we need to do is we need to offer either these services as essential services for free at no cost so that we can uplift people in South Africa. Uh, uh, before you go, because I'm burning to ask this okay. question, I think that our viewers also. Vodacom, MTN, these are multinational, <coughs> multi-continental um, companies. Mm -hmm. um, I think Thailand, I think, is one of the lowest costs, and I'm sure that these multinationals also have business interests mm. in other parts of the world. Why do they think they can come to South Africa and what makes them get away with this? Maybe, Peter, can, can, can you maybe shed some light on this? Thank you. I don't think it's a surprise that big companies want to make as much money as they can. That, that's what big companies do. What the surprise is, and I think the question we need to be asking, is why do we let them get away with it? And what I'm actually talking about there is the re regulation. The, when you talk about <coughs> Thailand, Kenya, there are many other uh, countries in Africa and Asia that in some ways are comparable to South Africa, but have got hugely lower telco mm. uh, telecommunications costs. For example, some of the states in India uh, cost uh, about a, a tenth of what they are in South Africa. The question isn't why are the companies not trying to be nice to us so we can do education and health. The question is why is the regulator, and I'm talking about uh, ICASA, the Independent Communication Authority of South Africa, allowing the companies to basically get away with huge, uh, almost extortionate rates. Um, Mike, Mike, can you please explain to us the delay in DTT and what it really is and what it stands for, DTT? Mm. Okay, DTT stands for <coughs> Digital Terrestrial Transmission, uh, and that is of, of television signals. And, uh, you know, the whole issue of, of digital broadcasting is very related to the costs of telecommunications because one of the main objectives for South Africa going through the migration from analog to digital broadcasting is to free up radio frequency spectrum for use by telecommu telecommunications companies. So, um, you know, that, that, that will ultimately be of, of benefit to, to the country uh, when all the television broadcasters are broadcasting on, on digital. And uh, that there, there are two means of digital transmission. One is the terrestrial means, in other words, all the transmitter masts that you see on, uh, on, on the hillsides around the, the towns, and the other is via satellite. So uh, South Africa has, has, is, is going through this, or is about to go through this process of migrating from analog broadcasting to digital broadcasting. Like I have to ask you, if I remember, and maybe our guests can maybe just bear me out here, we were supposed to migrate to coincide with the World Cup, and that didn't happen. So why was this, this one question is why the delay, and the second question is how does the delay impact on my democratic right to access media and to communicate? Right, well the delays were caused by uh, uh, various uh, arguments within government and between government and, and other parties. So uh, around, just, just before the World Cup, we had a Minister of Communications, uh, Sipiwi Nayanda, who uh, kind of derailed the whole migration process by, by uh, uh, wanting to consider another uh, 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 digital broadcasting standard. Uh, and, you know, he had various, uh, a couple of cu countries lobbying him to implement this other standard. So that, that, that was a major delay. Uh, the most recent delay is a, a, a battle between ETV and the Minister, Minister of Communications over the set-top boxes, which are required uh, to receive the digital broadcasting mm. signals. And uh, here, the Minister of Communications wanted Centec to be in charge of what happens on those set-top boxes in terms of encrypting uh, television signals. Can, can I just pause you there, Mike, mm -hmm. because you, you're talking language that I'm not always sure a, I understand, and B, okay. maybe our viewers don't. Yeah. What you're saying is that there's a whole battle mm -hmm. about control and also who gets to 
basically provide the service. Centec, mm. who I, if I'm not mistaken, has is a, is a quasi government. Yeah. It, it, it's yeah. partially owned by the government, yeah. Yeah. and of mm. course the big industry players. I mean, I want to come to you. Thank you, Mike. We're going to come back to you in a minute. Mm -hmm. I want to know about the costs in Africa. One and two, something that Peter <coughs> touched on: regulation. Mm. Who, why is this issue of regulation such a big thing in South Africa when we have the NDP, which is mm. all about economic development, when we have mm. a whole range, and Mark will be us out having working in, 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 in all the Alternative Information and Development Center, a whole range of economic mm. development um, plans in this country, mm. yet the cost of communication, the cost to be a small business is so high. Mm. Why is this? Helga, thank you for <laughs> asking that question. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a topic that's, that's very close to my heart. Um, uh, my research has shown that um, there, e there are elements of regulatory capture. What regula regulatory capture is, is that you have um, objects in the policy documents such as the National Broadband uh, Policy or the National Deve Development Plan or the DOC's uh, policy objectives. One of the Department, of communications. Department of Communications. One of these uh, policy objectives states at, at, um, in, in their documents, harnessing information and communication technology for socio-economic development. Now, what you would then expect to see is that the translation of these policy objectives reflect themselves in laws and regulation in the legislature and those sorts of things. And along the way, what you're finding is that it is not translating into appropriate regulation. Mm. And, and this is a concept that, that is um, called regulatory capture, where the noise made in the industry by the mobile network operators and ISPs is so loud that the, the, the voices of uh, people that, for example, the Right to Know campaign is not heard. Mm. And they don't have the resources nor the... The, 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 the lawyers. The lawyers, <laughs> you know, to be able to create uh, enough of an awareness. Uh, and so you have um, ICASA, the Independent Communication Authority of South Africa, who's meant to regulate, spending so much of their time uh, fighting these, uh, these battles uh, between operators who are asking for facilities, leasing, must carry regulations, and those sorts of things. Um, you're watching Free Media Free Minds, and we'll be right back. back with Free Media, Free Minds. Thanks for joining us. We're talking the high cost of communication. I mean, continue. We, we had such an exciting discussion during the break and our director saying we've got so much to add. So tell us about why we're we paying so much. And quite frankly, I'm tired of it. Please call me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's just put this in context, Helga. What you have is you've got very specific national conditions in South Africa. Uh, we've got <laughs> millions of poor people. And then you have some really exciting platforms, platforms um, that offer jobs, for example, or job and education development. You've got Career Planet, for example, and they offer an opportunity for skills development to prepare people for jobs, which is careerplanet.mobi. Now, people that are unemployed would need to access these platforms, because, and they don't have money, obviously, because they're unemployed. Now, what you have is you have the regulators who are meant to, to take national conditions into account. And they're meant to now take um, feedback to say, all right, how do we make things easier for this? But what they end up doing as part of regulatory capture is, is they end up serving the needs of the commercial players. Mm -hmm. Now, ICASA was, was meant to have uh, a consumer advisory panel. And, and that regulation was cancelled in 2010. And to date, ICASA, according to law, is meant to have a consumer advisory panel that looks at issues of, of these non-profit, non-commercial um, areas, which they don't. And, and that is essentially one of the reasons why you find that um, cost to communicate is so high and consumer voices are not heard. For me, it would seem from what Ahmed is saying that there, there are ways to make the cost to communicate cheaper, yeah, particularly for things like education and, and yeah. health. Yeah. Um, that's 
for my question, I have a question for, for Peter. Yeah. Peter, um, how does the cell phone present opportunities to, to, for health development in mm. Africa? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. When we think about cell phone services, we shouldn't just be thinking about horoscopes and football scores and um, love tips. It can be absolutely the access to information that keeps people alive. In South Africa, most of our citizens almost never go to health clinics. They rather stay away. As you will know, in three South African languages, the clinic's called the place you go to get ill, like the hospital is called the place you go to die. But mobile, as we know, around 90% of youth and adults have a cell phone, and that can be the primary access point to information that literally keeps people alive. Why in this country do we have over 100 companies selling pornography, but we've got no services if a woman is about to ra be raped, she can call for help? Why do we have so many uh, access to um, <coughs> violent and um, otherwise unuseful games, but you cannot SMS the word for diarrhea in any South African language and be told the three things you need to keep your child alive? With the national health insurance that the Department of Health is trying to bring in, bringing health to the majority of people, we want to make the cell phone be the primary point of contact. If your child is vomiting at 2 a.m., you can phone someone and not just be scared. Peter, I want to ask you, give us examples where cell phone technology is being used in the way that you described, because it stands to reason that we have such an enormous country, it is the one way that, 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 that governments can communicate with, 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 with people. Absolutely. Uh, it can be used in emergency situations, mm. calling for ambulances and uh, th things like that. Mm -hmm. In maternal health, it's often called the three delays that kill. The delay, if you've got a problem, to accessing a health professional, then a delay to knowing what the problem is that might need lab so results. So how can I use my cell phone to avoid the three delays? Absolutely. That's around emergency numbers to get in touch with local <coughs> midwives or other nurses. In Mexico, there's an absolutely stunning example where now many thousands of people's lives have been saved from this. Mm. But I think you're no. also working on this, Ahmed. In, in South Africa, there's a mobile platform called MAMA. I think it stands for Mothers Against Maternal Action. And it's mobile driven and it aims to support uh, maternal uh, care and, and yeah. support mothers for, uh, with maternal... Ma Mark, I want to come in here. Yeah. An example like Mama. Who stands to gain? And should Mama be... If, if, if it is a private company, yeah. who stands to gain? It's well, look, it's yeah. It, yeah. services that the examples we're giving are non-profit and they give access to information to people. The Right to Know campaign is saying we need to dramatically extend the number of free calls. At the moment, you can get an ambulance and a, and a 911. We're saying your children's school, your local clinic, these calls should all be free because you need to have emergency contact. But it's not only about accessing information, it's also about freedom of expression. I see you, Peter. Just give us a moment and Mark just finish. The yeah. cell phone gives us in the palm of our hands the ability to express ourselves, to organize, to produce multimedia, and it's the cost of communication for us calling non-official yeah. sources that is critical. The Right to Know campaign is saying we have to have a free basic piece of airtime and data, the same way we have water and electricity. And for us, the big question on the cost is what is the role of the private sector at all? Yeah. Because we've, we've seen our water is provided by the state, our electricity, why is there profit making at all in well, the telecommunications the, industry? The, the way that you describe it would seem that the right to communicate is a democratic right. Uh, just like the right to water, the right to housing, it's becoming one of, of, of a generation of rights that is it's part of my human rights. It's our freedom of expression, it's in the constitution, but it's also the right that is going to get us water and get us housing, okay. the right to access information. I know that Peter's coming and then we'll ask uh, maybe if we are. Peter? Thank you. Um, as Ahmed said, uh, MAMA, the Mobile Alliance for Maternal Action, is showing how mobile can greatly increase um, the power and the confidence of women to know how to look after their own health through pregnancy and w uh, when their baby is up to the second birthday, Amen. linking yeah. with health, health services. We've done many health in things. We know that these systems can increase HIV um, positive people taking medicines, in, uh, help around maternity, help around TB. 
the pilots work wonderfully. We can't go to scale of the millions of people that need it because of the costs, exactly the commodification that Mark and others are talking about. I mean, you have, you have the last word before we go to break, and then, Mike, we've not forgotten about you because we want to know about whether we can access free satellite TV. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, what I wanted to say was the Electronic Communications Act um, does make provision for what you consider essential services. Now, as Mark has pointed out, that um, should you really be making a profit of essential services, <clears throat> for example, a woman who has, uh, let's say, been domestically abused, and she wants to send an SMS for help and she doesn't have airtime, should she be paying for that? And this should be considered an essential service in terms mm -hmm. of the Electronic Communications Act, and this is not happening. So in order to, act, and, and profit and operators, mobile network operators should not be charging a rand for that SMS or two rand for it, or three rand for that megabyte of data, or two rand, I think it is, or for that when they make it. So the argument that I, I really want to advance is saying that these should be considered essential services because they help mm. uplift people. And the cost yeah. to communicate conversation is a conversation that forms part of what essential services are we offering via mobile that should yeah. not be profitable. And to just come in, there's research that shows an SMS itself costs under 2.3 cents. So these people are making over 30,000% profit on that SMS. There's no reason why it can't be free. Mark, you spoke, you said 30,000% on an SMS. I mean, that's like, I can't even begin to imagine what the profit margin on 30,000% is. But um, I mean, during the break, we were talking about this, this concept of a universal essential service. And let me explain to our viewers. This would be like a love life or an NGO who wants to provide a service, in the, in the case of domestic violence, a free call, gaining access and not having to pay the retail rates that the MTNs, the Vodacoms, will charge. And explain to us about this. So, through my work, um, I, I was, um, con I was uh, contracted to create interventions that would really work. Now, there are solutions to the problem. There's something called the universal service obligations that operators, mobile network operators and, and service providers have to comply with in order to keep their licenses. Uh, one of the interventions that I've taken through to the DOC, ICASA and USASA, the Universal Service and Access Agency of South Africa, is to create a, a model whereby all these services, um, like Love Life, um, where it's HIV AIDS platforms, or the job creation platforms or education or health, are considered as essential services. And by default, these services ought to reside on what you call a social services register, where all operators are not allowed to charge for these services because they're aimed at socioeconomic development. So we have the technical models, the business models, the entire thing. And, and that is the conversation we're still engaged with. Uh, ultimately, we believe that not charging uh, for services like that would encourage people to take them up. Mm -hmm. Our medium, TV. Um, Mike, does that kind of thing exist for TV as well? I know in America they have this thing called public access TV. Do we have the same kind of thing for television that where it is also deemed um, an essential service, some parts of it? Talk us through some of that. Well, public access television in, 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 in the States is uh, you know, base, basically equivalent to what uh, Cape Town TV is. So if you're watching Cape Town TV, you're watching public access television. Um, it's not, it's, it's not uh, uh, defined as an uh, 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 essential service. And um, you know, there's no di direct government support for, for community TV. And yet, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but the community television sector is determined to keep the cost of accessing, especially via this digital technology, keeping it low. Why is that? Yes, well, you know, when, when you discuss this concept of free media, you have to ask, how much does free media actually cost? and who pays for that, that, mm -hmm. that cost? Uh, because obviously it's not, not, not free in, in, in fundamental terms. So, you know, when it comes to issues around uh, these, these set-top boxes, which is what people are gonna have to go out and buy in order to, to receive television in, in, in the future, uh, there's, there's issues around uh, uh, the cost of, of that box. How, how much does, does it cost? You know, government is going to be subsidizing the, the, the cost for the, the, the about five million poor households in South Africa. And then there's also the question of the free-to-air television channels. So that is SABC, ETV, and, and, and the community channels. And there there's, there's, there's now debate as, as to, 
you know, are, are those channels simply freely available without any uh, in encryption? In other words, you can go out and buy any, any set-top box, you know, a cheap set-top box from China, for example, and, and get those, 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 those same channels? Or do you have to buy a, a box which is made in South Africa? That's one of the government ob objectives, is to try and protect the South African ma manufacturing in industry. Is, is that what the minister if I, um, and the new minister of communications, Yunus Karim, is that part of his agenda right now, Mark, is to make the set boxes freely available? Because I remember the 2010 World Cup lead up, that was part of the discussion. Well, the, the minister's conflicted at the moment, and uh, ETV's launched legal action, uh, which has forced the minister to consult very bro broadly and build some kind of consensus, and there is no consensus. The big threat here that the public need to be aware of is that if the set-top box is encoded, it means the signal can be switched on and off remotely. And we remember in Soweto around the, co the commodification of water and electricity in, in the Western Cape, it's now pay as you go. And if you don't pay, choop, the switch goes. Mm -hmm. We need to defend <coughs> free-to-air television. You do, shouldn't have to have any special passwords to be able to receive Cape Town mm. TV, SABC. But we also have to fight in the digital world to roll back NASPAS, DSTV. Because every day that goes past, more and more people are buying the NASPAS box, the DSTV box. Yeah, but I, if I can just come, come in there, I mean, one, one of the issues around in, encryption is that multi-choice, in other words, DSTV owned by NAS, NASPAS, mm. is opposed to in, encryption. Mm. Because if there's no in encryption of the television signal, it means that yeah. their Mnet decoders will be able to pick up those free-to-air yeah. channels with, with, you know, kind of free, free of charge without any, any costs yeah. in being incurred by, by Mnet. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's, there's that kind of opposing yeah. argument. But I think the, the real risk we're seeing now is that the longer we fail to migrate, more and more people are buying uh, entry-level DSTV packages. And we're looking at a real apartheid future where a section of South Africans will be in a privatized DSTV universe and the majority will be left with a very poor quality SABC, underfunded, under-resourced, dumbed-down television. And uh, again, it, if we want to have an inclusive information environment, we have to make sure that everyone ideally should be able to access every channel and we have to interrogate whether the, the communication field is a field where there's a place for profiteering and excluding people. I want to ask, if I can, Pumeza, um, the, what you describe is, or the, the, I'm sure that the right to know is talking about some kind of nationalization and the right to have access to visual communication as, as a democratic right. But I want to know, between Peter and Amit, because I know your backgrounds, what does television and cell phone look like on the rest of the continent? Are we lagging behind? So, <coughs> in terms of access? I think there's, there's a trend called uh, convergence. And convergence is called net neutrality. Uh, what this means is you have mobile, um, television, uh, computers, and IP, and everything coming together. So one of the visions are to make that happen. Now, you know, if, if I draw you back to, to what I said earlier, is that there are national conditions here in South Africa with millions of poor people. Which conversation should we be having? Should we be having the conversation around giving set-top boxes and TVs, or should we be having the conversation about improving people's lives now who have waited 20 years post-apartheid and are still suffering? Mm. That is what we should be looking at and focusing on. So, so in my view, the future of telecommunications in this country ought to be locally embedded, uh, situation-specific, rather than the global um, lights and, and yeah. excitement. We, we, we have to wrap, but um, I think Pumeza wants to... No, no, I was going to ask for the closing. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. My favorite quote in all this area comes from someone called Clay Shirky. These tools don't get socially interesting until they're technologically boring.
It's not the few um, uh, staggering things that the couple of hundred thousand iPhones in this country can do. It's can we turn the 40 million more basic cell phones into tools in the hands of the vast majority of people to get good quality health care, education, access to jobs, access to government services. The technology is there, it works. Mm -hmm. What is lacking is the imagination, the regulation and the support to change the technology that everyone has into a way to actually bring a revolution in this country. Mike, last? Yes, well, <clears throat> you know, when we're talking about digital television, we're talking about a digital communications in environment. So television is one aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Cellular communications is another aspect. The internet is, is another aspect. And this, this, this thing of convergence is bringing all of these devices together. So one, one of these days you'll be able to download SMSs on, on your television sets. I think that day is very close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amit, any last thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think I'd like to say that um, the conversations in, in the industry and uh, within government and policy need to be a lot more focused on the needs of uh, people whose voices are not heard. Mm, yeah. I mean, the technology is there. What's missing is the political will for our government to stand up to the big corporations that are profiteering. And we think it's the citizen voice. If we can organize and demand our right to communicate, it will make all the difference. Mm -hmm. I want to say thank you to all our guests on a very, very exciting and a topic that's very close to all our hearts, especially if you have a cell phone contract. And, <laughs> and pockets. Yeah. And pockets. So there we have it. We have the technology, we have the tools to make sure that your right to, and my right to communicate um, is cheap um, and is part of, 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 of a generation of rights that we can call our human rights. Yet, as Marcus said, we do seem to lack the political will. And so we need to support the Right to Know campaign to continue agitating for greater regulation so that we have greater access. From Free Media, Free Minds, I'm Helgi Jansen Daubier. And I'm Pumas of Degazi. But please, catch our show, our, the repeats of our show, every Friday morning at 7.30 and Sunday evenings at 10.30. Thank you, bye. I am ready.